efficiency and effectiveness in government programs. IGs provide an independent voice within federal agencies helping to ensure that tax dollars are spent with the taxpayers' best interests in mind. In the last Congress, this committee passed into law the Inspector General Reform Act of 2008, a bipartisan bill that strengthened the independence and accountability of IGs. The committee's ongoing review of IG authorities has found more restrictions that hampered the ability of IGs to carry out their oversight mission. H.R. 5815 will further strengthen the authority of IGs so they can protect the interests of the taxpayers. In FY 2008, Inspector General identified $18.6 billion in potential savings from the audits and investigations. H.R. 5815 will make agencies accountable for implementing all actions needed to recover potential savings of tax dollars. H.R. 5815 requires the head of agencies to take corrective actions to address problems identified by IGs or report to Congress why such action is not necessary or appropriate. H.R. 5815 will also provide IGs with the authority to subpoena witnesses who are not government employees, such as contractors of grantees as part of their audits and investigations. The grant of testimonial subpoenas authority is overwhelmingly supported by the IG community. This authority would enhance the ability of IGs to conduct more thorough audits and investigations. H.R. 5815 will further enhance IG's effectiveness and independence by exempting IG's from certain requirements of the Paperwork Reduction Act and the Computer Matching and Privacy Protection Act of 1988. These acts require IG's to seek approval from their agencies and the House, White House for certain activities impending the independence of IG investigators. I encourage all members to support this measure which will yield significant benefits in terms of cost saving for the taxpayers. And of course, I want to thank um, the ranking member, Congressman Issa, for co-sponsoring uh, this bill with me. And at this time, I yield five minutes to the gentleman from California to talk about how important this bill is. <laughs> Congressman Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for your leadership on this important issue. As you know, we are a partisan body in order to do bipartisan and nonpartisan work, we depend on experts, we just depend on independent eyes and ears. Often we get that from outside agencies, but more than ever, we depend on the IGs. Their inspections, their capability to dig into subject matter that they are uniquely qualified to observe and to evaluate is the most valuable tool we have in government. Without them, we would be holding hearings, often in the blind, or simply on a my side says, your side says. Along with the GAO, they represent the most important tools of this committee, and more than anything else, the tools this committee has greatest jurisdiction over. In March, I wrote the, each Inspector General and asked for legislative suggestions on ways to enhance their ability to do their jobs. The legislative community uh, Committee of Counsel of the Inspector Generals on Integrity and Efficiencies wrote us in the spring and identified some important areas. As we have gone through this bill from the time I was pleased to co-sponsor it with the Chairman, we have found additional areas that need to be dealt with, some of which we will deal with here today, some of which I hope to finalize over the August break. But notwithstanding that, Mr. Chairman, the work has been done, the recognition of the key areas that need to be dealt with to give IGs the real authority to dig deep and, if necessary, dig outside of simply asking their own people. As the Chairman said, and I completely agree, an IG who can only ask their employees but cannot bring in government contractors and others is an IG that lacks the ability to do their job and often gives us a report that we then have to use our subpoena power to go after the other side of the story. That should not be the case. Mr. Chairman, I join with you and the other members on both sides of the aisle in saying the time has come to dig deeper, get more transparency, and to empower the IGs in this effort. And with that, I support the bill and yield back balance my time. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for his statement and thank you for his support. Uh, and any other members seeking to speak on the bill? 
Yeah, gentleman from uh, Maryland. Let's just have some here. questions. Um, <clears throat> to Mr. Issa, uh, or the chairman. The, when we deal with subpoena power of this nature, um, one of the things, and I've seen this as a lawyer, uh, particularly with regard to criminal law, a lot of times um, the concern is to make sure that um, possible witnesses, there are certain restrictions and uh, safeguards with regard to just the nilly-willy going out and asking anybody anything, anytime. And a lot of people, um, if you ever represented anybody in a criminal matter, you know that uh, these matters, and these I know we're dealing with a lot of stuff here, but stuff that could start off civil and end up criminal. But these matters can shake up somebody's life. Uh, we watched it here a few years ago on this committee during the Clinton administration when people were brought into this room uh, having to hire lawyers um, and, you know, just, I mean, raked across the coals and um, only be found later on that they hadn't done anything. Now, I understand the, that subpoena power to have people come in and testify is very important. I got that. But where are the safeguards to make sure that, because these, first of all, what is the problem? Uh, and I'm just curious as to, they didn't, I know that DLD IG has it. They didn't have it, but they didn't have it before, and they're not using it. And, but I'm trying to figure out what problem are we really resolving here? And are we, um, you know, the, people's civil liberties are very, very, uh, very important. Um, a lot of times I think uh, we think it's, it's, it's just easy to have people, uh, you know, get a phone call from the powers that be and say, I want you in here and I want you to testify. But where are the safeguards in the bill? And you can show them to me. I'd like to see them. Right. The gentleman uh, raised a very interesting question, which one that I must admit uh, that I'm concerned about and have thought about. But in this, uh, uh, in order to use this authority in any matter involving a possible violation of federal criminal law, mm -hmm. uh, the IG is required to notify the Attorney General. That's the first thing who may object to the issuing of the subpoena. So that's there. And this allows the AG to keep the IG from issuing a subpoena if it would interfere with the Justice Department's criminal work. Uh, and I guess the other thing would be uh, uh, Congress provided you know, testimonial uh, subpoena authority to the Department of Defense Inspector General in 2009. And concerns have not been raised about uh, or over use of frivolous use of this authority. Now, H.R. 5815 provides more checks on the use of the authority than what Congress approved for the DOD and, of course, the DOD's IG. Uh, and, and, of course, I guess uh, just add this DOD IG um, has not yet used the authority and would do so only when absolutely necessary to advance an investigation. So I feel very comfortable with that in mind. I now yield with, with the gentleman yield? My, yeah. Be uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, well, thank you well, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Go uh, ahead. Uh, my, uh, okay. Just one second. I just wanted just to address one thing. Let's play this out. And what happens when the um, Attorney General has a conflict? with the IG. I mean, th this is not, this, and that is, that can easily happen because the kind of stuff we're talking about, uh, somebody from this Congress can call and say, look, IG, I want you to do this and investigate this. It may be something that affects the administration and the, and let's say for good reason, the IG, I mean, the Attorney General says, no, I, I don't want to do that. The next thing you know, we've got folks hollering and screaming saying, that somebody is trying to cover up something. I, I mean, I can see that coming as sure as I'm sitting here. So I just want, I'm just, I mean, I, I want us to, I'm just, I'm just, these are just issues that I'm concerned about because I've lived through it. I've seen it sitting on this committee for all these years, what can happen to people. But uh, 
uh, if ahead. the gentleman would yield, yes. uh, I share your concerns. Uh, although you mentioned the Clinton years, one might mention the Waxman hearings in the Bush years, uh, but that's this committee. I believe there are a couple of areas that the gentleman might want to consider. First of all, IGs work for somebody. They don't work in a vacuum. A cabinet officer or the president can dismiss them. Uh, so they, their use of IG, their use of subpoenas are clearly overseen by normally their cabinet position, uh, and they can be terminated for any abuse, uh, something that you and I know doesn't happen here quite the same. More importantly, I believe that in the case of the AG, and which is a very good point, uh, the AG would have the ability, and if they don't, I'd look at working with the chairman and yourself to make sure this bill is clear, to uh, transfer that in a conflict to another person within justice that would be able to do the job if they had a conflict. I do think the gentleman has brought up some very good points, and, and although I hope we move this today, uh, in the six weeks of the, of the break, I think that uh, adding into a manager's amendment particular language to deal with those concerns, and perhaps even as to DOD, so that we, we do recognize that in civil suits people have subpoena authority, but they have safeguards. Uh, we need to view it the same, that the IG is not a criminal uh, investigator, but in fact working like a civil investigator to try to get to the truth and that there should be safeguards for individuals. And I, I'd, I'd be very happy to have our staffs work with yours to get it right uh, before it goes to the floor. Thank you, gentlemen. Chairman, I see my time has run out, but may I respond uh, yeah, yeah, very briefly? Gentlemen, additional minute. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the ranking member for what you just said. And Mr. Chairman, I, if, if, if we can do that, I would feel a lot more comfortable. I mean, we can proceed with the bill, but I'd like to work that out because I think the chairman and the ranking member have expressed concerns about making sure the rights of people are safeguarded as best we can. And, um, Mr. Chairman, I would hope that you'd work, we could work with you and try to do We're delighted to continue to work with the Department of Justice and the Inspector General to try and strengthen it. Thank you very much. I think you raise a very interesting point, and we'd be delighted to uh, pursue it and see in terms of how we can strengthen it, because I must admit that you, your point is well taken. Any other comments? I, I actually um, I understand that, of course, um, I recognize the gentleman from Texas. I understand that he has an amendment, so it's open for amendments now at any time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ranking Member Issa, and uh, I do have an amendment at the desk, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, H.R. 5815, the Inspector General Authority Improvement. Amendment to H.R. 5815, offered by Mr. Cuellar of Texas. Strike Section 5 and insert the following. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. My amendment is very simple. Along with a few technical changes, I've included language that would require the Inspector General report to provide a description of any potential cost savings that are generated by any corrective action. I think this is very, very important because not only should the IG identify problems, abuses, or deficiencies, but I think it's also necessary the inclusion that requires them to address the cost savings, especially in a uh, time that we're trying to make sure that we use our taxpayers uh, efficiently, the uh, taxpayer dollars efficiently. Uh, my amendment also addresses the certification that is sent off to Congress. As you know, the certification of Congress is when the head of an establishment uh, agency determines that no action is needed or appropriate with respect to the IG recommendations. Uh, if no action is taken, the head of, uh, of this agency submits a certification of Congress. Uh, my language requires that along with submitting a certification of Congress, the head uh, also includes a detailed explanation why no such action uh, is necessary. Uh, I believe this will, uh, with these two amendments, I believe this will create uh, uh, more enhanced value to the Inspector General report. One is to see what the cost savings are, and number two, if they send out that certification, at least we as members of Congress should know why they're not accepting that particular variance or su suggestion from the um, uh, from the IG. So, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ranking Member, I thank you for this opportunity uh, to submit this necessary amendment to H.R. Uh, 5815. I thank the gentleman from Texas for his, his amendment. Any other members wish to be heard on the amendment? This amendment strengthens and clarifies the accountability provision in this bill, and I am prepared to support it and encourage all members to do so. 
The question is on the Cuellar Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Illinois. Uh, just a point of clarification, as, as on our sheets, it does a, uh, note that I have an amendment. I, I just want to let you know, and for the record, in discussions with your staff and the ranking member, the language that we discussed uh, involving the ability of IGs to obtain the read-only access to this information, uh, it's our understanding this morning that not all of the IGs had an opportunity to wade in on that. And in discussions again with the uh, ranking member and the, your staff, we decided that we would uh, continue to work on that, uh, not deal with the amendment this morning, but to make sure it's part of the manager's amendment when the language is, is to uh, our satisfaction and the IGs have way beyond perhaps necessity this morning, but as a point of caution, to make sure they're comfortable with this, we'll give them the weeks that we're off and include it in the manager's amendment. If uh, and if they don't get involved, we'll include it anyway. Right. Um, <laughs> I tell Jennifer from Illinois that uh, I look forward to uh, working with you during this period to try and see in terms of uh, that we can't um, involve as many as possible and uh, be able to uh, continue to move the legislation forward. And of course, there's a strong possibility we could. Uh, do that in the manager's amendment. And would the gentleman yield? I'd be delighted to yield to the gentleman. Uh, from, from and the I, I, too, join with uh, Mr. Quigley that uh, the language that would uh, define the access to databases in a safe fashion to give more direct access to the IGs is critical, but needs to have uh, the exact wording that is comfortable with all the IGs so that they, uh, they have what is deliverable. Uh, guaranteed, but not overstep what, what could be available. So I look forward to working with the gentleman and your staff uh, to get the language right before we go to the floor uh, on his amendment. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, any other amendments? Hearing no further amendments, the question is on agreeing to H.R. 5815 as amended. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposes say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and H.R. 5815 as amended is agreed to, and without objections, H.R. 5815 as amended is ordered reported favorably to the House. The committee will now consider S2868, the Federal Supply Schedule Usage Act of 2009, which was introduced in the Senate by Senator Joseph Lieberman. The Senate passed S-2868 by unanimous consent on May 24th. This bill authorizes the Administrator of General Services to provide for the use of the federal supply scheduled by the American Red Cross and state and local governments to prepare for and respond to disasters. This bill gives the Red Cross and state and local governments the ability to purchase specific goods and services through pre-negotiated contracts for the federal supply schedule, thereby saving the administrative costs of negotiating contracts and leveraging the economy of scale of the federal government buying power. We have given state and local governments this authority for other categories of products such as IT and emergency equipment, and it has worked well, so this bill expands it to disaster preparedness. Uh, I urge the members of the committee to support this good government, common sense legislation. And I recognize the ranking member of the committee for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I support the bill and I support its goals. This legislation allows the administration of uh, the GSA to make the American Red Cross eligible to purchase from the federal supply schedules for the purpose of preparing and responding to disasters. I will be offering an amendment because a good idea generally is a better idea if more people have access to it. I am a strong and long supporter of the American Red Cross and believe that they are critical to virtually every disaster. But as the Chairman knows, around the world, GSA uses and makes available under their schedule these uh, preferred pricing and, and streamlined uh, sourcing capability to other non-government organizations working hand in hand with our government. So as you can imagine, if we are in Haiti 
and 25 organizations have access to these materials, but we are in Louisiana and only the Red Cross has access, that would be clumsy and probably require the Red Cross to essentially be a conduit for other organizations working there if, in fact, those items, once streamlined and reduced in cost, would be preferable. So my amendment, in short, and I won't be making a statement on my amendment when I offer it, will be to expand it to other necessary organizations working, uh, working in harmony. Uh, and with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, I would re uh, and I apologize, it is actually Mr. Gao's amendment, uh, but the minority amendment will do, seek to expand that at the appropriate time, and I yield back. Will the if gentleman yield? If it is a good amendment, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it is a great amendment. The gentleman yield, gentleman yield for a question? Gentleman yield for a question? I would like to yield to the gentlewoman from California. Um, I am curious whether or not States have access to GSA. Do they presently have access? In for certain categories. So, yeah, for certain categories. Well, in terms of homeland security, things like that, disaster, national guard. Yes. Thank you. Mm. The gentleman from Massachusetts. Just a further question. Is the gentleman's amendment to the effect that GSA would re be required to open up the entire uh, schedule to any entity that wanted to gain that preferred pricing or is this something that the GSA would have to do or something they have the option of doing? No, it's actually just Red Cross, Cross and uh, state and local government. With the, the, the I, the I know the original intent was for the Red Cross, but the further amendment by the, by the ranking member uh, would that just open it up to any and all? If the gentleman would yield, uh, it, uh, Mr. Gao's amendment would, uh, would only make it openable to eligible or organizations. Now, ultimately, FEMA and other organizations are determining who is, in fact, a respondent. So once they put, let's just, say, let's just assume for a moment that the Boy Scouts are responding and not the Red Cross. In that situation, yes, they would give them the same openness that they gave to the Red Cross. But the agency has the determination of who is okay. appropriate. All right. Thank you. I yield back. Right. I call up uh, the amendment 2868. S. 2868, an act to provide increased access to the General Services Administration schedules program by the I American Red Cross. I consider that it be considered as read, and I recognize the gentleman from uh, Louisiana for five minutes to explain his amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Kirk would now designate the amendment. No, Louisiana. Louisiana. <laughs> <laughs> It's okay. People mistake me all the time. <laughs> Recognize the gentleman for five minutes. Explain his amendment. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Chairman, this amendment uh, would allow all qualified nonprofit disaster relief organizations, such as the Salvation Army and Catholic Charities USA, to have access to the price discounts offered by the federal supply schedules and it will enhance the delivery of disaster relief and recovery goods and services in areas of the U.S. affected by a disaster. In the wake of Hurricane Katrina, a multitude of organizations beyond the American Red Cross were in New Orleans providing disaster relief. More recently, after, after the tragic earthquake in Haiti, the New York Times listed at least 41 large-scale disaster relief organizations to which Americans could contribute. These organizations should also be included in this bill. Knowledge of the greatest needs and how to fulfill those needs. These local organizations should be covered by this bill as well. Mr. Chairman, there is precedent for this amendment. GSA's website contains a list of organizations currently eligible to purchase from the schedules. These organizations are diverse, including among those the Inter-American Tropical Tuna Commission, the International Fertilizer Development Center, the Lake Ontario Claims Tribunal, and the Universal Postal Union. That list just uh, scratches the surface. And given that my district 
Orleans and Jefferson Parishes and Louisiana generally have benefited from multiple relief agencies, we recommend offering this amendment to this committee and I ask that uh, all members uh, of this committee support the amendment. Uh, thank you, and I yield back my time. Gentlemen, yields back. Any other members seeking recognition? Mr. Chairman, I only uh, recognize the gentleman from California. I only ask unanimous consent that a, uh, a list printed in the New York Times of those organizations that uh, participated in the Haiti disaster relief and were recognized by GSA be included for the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Chairman. I appreciate the um, Representative Chow's effort in, his, uh, in, in this bill. His amendment improves this bill, and I'm prepared to support it. Uh, if no other members wish to speak on the amendment, the question is on adopting the uh, Gao amendment. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. The ayes have it, perfecting the amendment as agreed to. Um, hearing no further amendments, the question is on 2688 as amended. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and S 2868 as amended is agreed to. Without objection, H.R. 2868 as amended is ordered reported favorably to the House. The committee will now consider H.R. 2853, the All-American Flag Act, which was introduced by Representative Bruce Braley. Uh, this bill requires that the flags of the United States of America, regardless of size bought by the federal government, be 100 percent manufactured in the United States. Additionally, anything used to make or produce the flags must be 100 percent grown, produced, or manufactured in the United States. I was surprised to learn that current law only requires 50 percent of the material used to manufacture flags for the federal government be, to be American made. It makes sense to me that flags used by our government should be made and produced by its citizens. I urge the members of the committee to support this common sense uh, good legislation and I recognize uh, the ranking member at this time for his comments on the issue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As you know, on 9-11, America began flying uh, flags in huge numbers. It was shortly after that the uh, U.S. Congress discovered that we could not procure enough flags made in America, even under the 50 percent rule, to meet our needs. This bill seeks to require flags be made by Americans for Americans. And in this case, by, by modifying the Act, we believe that we will facilitate the, uh, the ret retention of an ongoing capability in the United States to manufacture in sizes and shapes necessary American flags. This is not a large part of uh, the purchase of American flags. When you go to Homes and Lowe's, uh, Lowe's and Home Depot and other places, you may very well not find a American flag made in America. But at least as to those purchased with taxpayers' dollars and often flown over the Capitol or placed upon a deceased soldier's uh, coffin, you will find an American flag. Although we, uh, we do have a, a small amendment, we believe that this bill will pass the House overwhelmingly and become law. And with that, I thank the gentleman and yield back. Any other members seeking recognition? The gentlewoman from well, Washington, D.C. <clears throat> um, 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 Mr. Speaker, I just want to say I very much appreciate this, this, this bill or this amendment. Um, there is increasing concern about the fact we don't make very much in America anymore. And the theme, making in America, is beginning to emerge. We can't do that uh, often by legislation. But this legislation could not only uh, help save an American industry, who, after all, makes the 
uh, pin, the ultimate American product, but it could stimulate uh, the flag-making industry uh, because the, the government is indicating that it wants to buy flags made in America. It does say much about how low we have been taken that we ha can't even make flags in our country. I understand the apparel industry and the difficulties uh, involved uh, with respect to it and many other manufacturing industries. But we're going to start anywhere. Let's start with the American flag, please. Thank you very much. I thank you, gentlemen, for her statement, and I think she's so right. Any other members seeking recognition? Yeah, I, at this time I ask for uh, another, no other members to speak. I now call up H.R. 2853, the All American Flag Act. H.R. 2853, a bill to require the purchase of domestically made flags of the United States of America. Without objection, uh, considered as read. And I now recognize the gentleman from California to offer an amendment. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I would. Uh, Clerk would designate the amendment. Amendment at the desk. Amendment to H.R. 2853, offered by Mr. Bill Bray of California. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read, and I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to speak on behalf of his amendment. Gentleman Thank you, Mr. Chairman. California. I'm sure that all of us, when we talk about flags made in America by Americans, we, we take it for granted that we are meaning uh, flags legally made in the United States. Um, and all my amendment does is make sure that we continue what the um, new administration has moved forward to make sure that whenever we um, place these mandates out that we qualify the fact that um, legal employers and legal employees are part of the law and need to be executed with our directions. And Mr. Chairman, let me just say there's been a lot of controversy in the last a uh, month about, um, you know, the issue of those who are legal or not legal in here, and there have been a lot of controversy about what kind of tactics ought to be taken. But the one place that there's been common ground um, where you could even get somebody like the Obama administration and somebody like Tom Tancredo agreeing on is E-Verify. The Obama administration said this is something that works, something is expanded, something that should be the new standard. When you can get Arizona and Massachusetts agreeing on this policy. I think this is one common ground we can join on. I think this is one of those things that are very simple. If you, we, our standard is that we want our flags made in the United States, made by legal employers um, who are making sure they're following the law. And this, this um, amendment just uh, clarifies that and put, um, places it clearly right up front that American made in America by legal Americans. And I yield back. Any other members seeking recognition? Briefly. A gentleman from California, ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I support this amendment. Uh, the chairman earlier uh, used the term Americans. Anyone who is legally in America enjoys the term American from a standpoint of worker. E Verify simply recognizes that we want to ensure that people have a legal status to produce that flag and that we not simply move people from one country to another to make flags and then call them made in America. At the same time, I also believe that in government contracting, government purchasing and the like, it is well established that we pay good wages, we pay a fair price for products, and we should expect that all of our vendors comply with all laws, and including those that require that they pay above the table fair wages to their people. I believe that this uh, sensible amendment goes a long way to ensuring that you not have an underground economy producing American flags. With that, I urge its support and yield back. Any other members seeking recognition? Let me just say that um, we're, not to, we're not supposed to hire undocumented workers anyway, uh, but I want you to know that I do not find the amendment uh, harmful, so therefore I'm prepared to accept the um, amendment. If no other members wish to speak on an amendment, the question is now on adopting the Bill Bray Amendment. All those in favor say no. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. Mr. Chair. Yep. Recognize the gentleman from California. I apologize. Could I uh, ask for a roll call vote on that amendment? And I appreciate the support. Gentleman asked for a roll call. Correct me to call the roll. Mr. Towns. Aye. Mr. Towns votes aye. Mr. Kanjorski. Mrs. Maloney. Mr. Cummings. Mr. Kucinich. Mr. Tierney. Mr. Clay, Ms. Watson, Mr. Lynch, 
Mr. Cooper, Mr. Connolly, Mr. Quigley, Ms. Kaptur, Ms. Norton, Ms. Norton votes aye, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. Davis, Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Cuellar, Mr. Hodes, Mr. Murphy, Mr. Murphy votes aye, Mr. Foster, Ms. Spear, Ms. Spear votes aye, Mr. Driehaus, Ms. Chu, Ms. Chu votes no. Mr. Issa? Aye. Mr. Issa votes aye. Mr. Burton? Mr. Micah? Mr. Duncan? Mr. Turner? Mr. Westmoreland? Mr. McHenry? Mr. Bilbray? Mr. Bilbray votes aye. Mr. Jordan? Mr. Jordan votes aye. Mr. Flake? Mr. Fortenberry? Mr. Chaffetz? Mr. Chaffetz votes aye. Mr. Schock? Mr. Schock votes aye. Mr. Lukemeyer? Aye. Mr. Lukemeyer votes aye. Mr. Gao? Aye. Mr. Gao votes aye. Mr. Schuster? On that vote, Mr. Chairman, 11 ayes, 1 no. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, Mr. Driehaus. Mr. Driehaus. Mr. Driehaus votes aye. Mr. Any member seeking recognition? Gentleman from Tennessee. Any other members? No. Um, Mr. Duncan votes aye. Anyone else not recorded? Anyone else not recorded? 13-1. Anyone that has not been recorded? Mr. Lynch? Yes. Mr. Lynch votes aye. Yeah. Mr. Lynch votes votes aye. Okay. The clerk will report the vote. On that vote, Mr. Chairman, there is 14 ayes, one no. That the ayes have it. So the perfected amendment is agreed to. Are there any more amendments? Hearing no amendments, the question is on agreeing to HR 2853 as amended. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and H.R. 2853, as amended, is agreed to. Without objection, H.R. 2853, as amended, is ordered reported favorably to the House.